Welcome to the Faith Bible Church Podcast. We hope the message you're about to hear is a blessing in your growth in Jesus Christ. We also pray that the message is not a substitute for your critical place in the local church and in community. Thanks again for joining us. Just before my first real job in church ministry, I had a chance to work at a place that was familiar to me in Arkansas. While I was in college and I trusted in Jesus, what I did first, I thought was pretty wise. In fact, I just stumbled upon it. What I did was try to surround myself with good godly men that were a few years older than me that had been walking with Jesus much longer than me. And I asked a lot of questions, and whenever they sort of encouraged me to go and do this or do that, I just sort of said yes to everything, you know. Um, So I remember it was very short after I had, shortly after I had trusted in Jesus, I'm like, what are you guys doing this summer, you know? And several of them were going to work at summer camps, Christian summer camps, sports camps or adventure camps or whatever. And they're like, you should do that. And I was like, okay, how do I do that? And so I just went and signed up and had an interview for a camp in Arkansas, I knew nothing about, and they offered me a job, and I was like, great, when do I show up? And they're like, you want to work the whole summer? And I was like, yes, I'll work the whole summer because I was foolish, and I didn't know (laughs) what that actually meant. And so it was like a death sentence to work the whole summer, Uh, but I did it, and it was amazing. And I was um, a cabin leader, um, met actually several of the church members in our church now. God's brought us back together who are now married and raising families here. We have this connection back at Camp Ozark in nowhere, Arkansas. It was fantastic. Um, The next summer, um, I was again listening to the people around me and these godly men, and I was like, what are you doing this summer? And one of them was like, I'm going to work as a church intern. And I was like, what's that? You know, again, I didn't have any experience with this. And they're like, well, you go and you just sort of, you're a slave all summer and they pay you in bologna sandwiches. And I was like, sounds amazing. Where do I do that? You know, and, and so I got an interview and came to a church and they offered me a church a position over the summer in the Woodlands, Texas. Who would have known, Right. Uh, But the end of school happened here for that semester, and then I didn't officially start for a couple of weeks later, and so in between, I decided to drive back up to Camp Ozark, where I'd worked the year before, and uh, join their work crew for a couple of weeks as they got ready for the first session of campers and students to come in. Um, And it was fantastic. I saw some of my old friends. I couldn't be there for the summer. I had a different job, obviously, but I wanted to be there, and all I did was, for a couple of weeks, work. Um, And I remember my job. Uh, one of the big jobs was uh, facilities guy, camp guy, brought me to the back of a new cabin. And I was like, man, this new cabin, this wasn't here last summer. He's like, yeah, we just built it, but we had discovered a problem when we dug the foundations of this. It's kind of in the side of a hill, a mountain. He said, we didn't properly support what was behind it. And so what I need you to do over the course of these two weeks If you can do it quicker, um, it'd be great. We'll give you a group of guys to work with. I need you to build a retaining wall behind this cabin. Keep the mountain from taking the cabin away. I'm like, yes, please, let's do that. So we don't want campers dying um, here at Camp Ozark, you know? And so I was like, I've never built a retaining wall. He's like, no problem. I'll tell you how to do it, you know? He said, here's your pile of supplies. And I looked and there was a couple of tractor trailer loads of railroad ties a pile of rebar, reinforcement bar, some shovels, pickaxes, and sledgehammers, and an angle grinder. And I was like, that, is that all I need? They're like, yes, that is a deconstructed retaining wall, okay? All that's needed is sweat, probably a lot of blood, but mostly sweat. And uh, we'll tell you how to do it. I was like, okay. So we dug, we dug it out, made sure our foundation was good. We laid down that first row of uh, railroad ties and drove stakes into the ground pretty deep, drilled holes. And then on a certain angle, we put the next level behind it and we drilled holes and put, made sure that was tied in really securely to the one below it and we filled in the earth. And then we kept stacking at a very specific angle and filled in, tamped it in and do our little angles around the side. And in, by the end of a couple weeks with a whole lot of blisters and sweat, um, we had this retaining wall that kept this large section of earth, at least it was attempting to, uh, from taking this cabin away. And it was, it was quite a sense of accomplishment. I haven't been back since. 
Um, but I can tell you, we, we walked by it before we left and we're like, we, we did that. We did that. And we were proud of it. It was probably over seven feet tall by the end of it in the center of it. And we, we were really proud of that work. I've never built a retaining wall since. And the only reason I tell you that story is that's the image I see when and I repeatedly came to the text that we're going to read today in 1 Thessalonians, a retaining wall. I know it's a little bit of a strange image, but you'll probably have a similar thought picture in your mind when we get to it. I think Paul is wanting us to be a bit of a retaining wall, not so much against things, but for things in our culture and for the Lord and for the faith. And so that's what we're going to see and ask what our role is and how God would establish us in that sort of manner for um, the church, for the gospel, for truth and grace in the culture that we're in. And so we're in 1 Thessalonians. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, please, please open to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. If you didn't bring a Bible, you can turn a Bible app on on your phone or your iPad at home. You can grab your Bible, open it up to 1 Thessalonians 3. We'd encourage you to bring a Bible to uh, church with you. If you don't have one, please stop by guest services. We'd be happy to give you one as a gift um, so that you can uh, bring that with you and just underline things, circle things, write things in the margin if you want. There are some sermon notes almost every week available online through our app or on our website, which has some um, additional insight, some quotes from scholars and commentaries and discussion questions for small groups. So we're in First Thessalonians 3. This is our series called Future Glory Present Trial. And uh, God has really given us this series, these two books, these two letters of Paul to the ancient church of Thessalonica, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, that we will study almost all of this calendar year. Um, we're taking it pretty slow because we want to slow down and see what God has for us in this brilliant, beautiful text. And so we're in 1st Thessalonians chapter 3. We're going to study verses 6 through 10, but we're going to start in verse 1 and just sort of ramp our way into it, ascend into our text and remind ourselves where we were last week. All right? Short recap is Paul and Silas and Timothy planted a church in Thessalonica, a very cosmopolitan, large city. Um, they were there for a couple of months before they got ran out of town. And they loved this church very uniquely. More than most of the other churches, I would dare say what we get from Paul, he really likes the church at Philippi, which is just down the road, planted maybe a couple of weeks before the church in Thessalonica was planted. He speaks great things to the Philippian church in his letter. But the letter of 1 Thessalonians in particular has chapter upon chapter upon chapter of celebration of their faith, of gratitude and prayer for how they are uh, enduring ongoing perse uh, persecution and affliction and how they are staying firmly grounded and rooted, securely footed in their faith and love. And that's partly what we're going to see. So as soon as Paul and Silas and Timothy are ran out of town, his first chance he sends Timothy back to check on the church. And then when Paul and Silas are at another location, Timothy comes back to them with the report. And then in response to that report, Paul writes this letter and sends it back. We don't know who carries the letter back to the church, but we think it's about the year 50. And so a lot of that context finds itself in this text. 1 Thessalonians 3, uh, verse 1, let's uh, ramp up into it. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we as Paul, Silas, and Timothy, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction, and so it came to pass, as you know. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith, for fear the tempter might have tempted you, and our labor would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always think kindly of us, Longing to see us just as we also long to see you for this reason, brethren, in all of our distress and afflictions, we were comforted about you through your faith. For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. 
For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account? As we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. You get a lot of background story and context and then right in the middle is this beautiful, beautiful, simple statement that we're gonna um, spend most of our time on today. Let's start in the end of the passage, verse 10. Then we'll go up to verse six and then we're gonna center in on that center passage. The end, I, I wanna explain first, as he says in the last phrase that's on your screen, that we may complete what is lacking in your faith. Paul actually says that several times in other letters. It sounds a bit heavier than it is. And I just wanna explain that. It sounds a bit like Paul is some kind of coming down on them. Hey guys, uh, you don't really fully believe or you don't believe the truth and so I gotta correct you and make sure that you are in the right way. So there's something lacking in your faith. I, I don't want you to read it that heavily because that's not the intention. Paul is saying exactly what would be completely understood in that original context. And we see it clearly when we get to the next chapter, 1 Thessalonians 4 and the chapter of that 5 and all of 2 Thessalonians. Paul is simply saying this, hey, you guys are young in the faith. There's lots of things that you don't know yet. And there's a couple of things right now that are a little problematic. And so my role as the father of the church, the planter of the church, is to make sure that I help you fill in the blanks that you have with truth and help you correct the blanks that you've already filled if they're a little bit off. So for instance, in chapter four, he's gonna talk about sexual immorality and some things that they were doing. He's like, hey, I, I need you guys to correct this. Then he's gonna talk about theology. He goes, you guys are wondering about what happens to believers when they die and what happens to them in regards to the resurrection and Jesus' return. You've got some of those mixed up and I wanna lay them out straight for you. That's what he's talking about. This is almost a bit, verse 10, the end of verse 10, almost a bit of an introduction into the last two chapters of 1 Thessalonians and the whole of 2 Thessalonians, which very likely comes shortly on the heels of this first letter. So he says, hey, I wanna complete what is lacking in your faith. It's not that the faith was empty or wrong, but just that there were holes in it. There were issues, and he says, this is my job. This is why I love you, and this is my role. I'm gonna try to do that in this letter and the other letter um, that's coming, and I hope Timothy did that. And again, we long to see your face, and maybe one day we'll be back with you again, and I can continue to pour my heart and truth into you so that your faith gets stronger, more solid, more secure, okay? And that's what we do together for each other. That's what I hope I get to do for you and other teachers in our church and pastors and elders and small group leaders and adult community leaders and ministry team leaders. We get to encourage each other and complete what is lacking in our faith. Again, that has a bit of a bite to it because it sounds like, wait a second, are you saying that my faith is lacking? In the words of Paul, yes, because all of our faith is lacking in some sense. There are holes and cracks and blanks that have yet to be filled. We encourage each other, teach each other, and in times that are necessary, we reprove and correct and rebuke each other in the love of the Lord. That's what Paul is saying here. I need you to understand that. It's not as quite as harsh as it sounds. Now let's go back up to verse six. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news, I want you to hold on to three things that Timothy has brought good news about. It's right in the text. So three things. Timothy has brought us good news of your faith, that's one, of your faith, that's one, and love, two, and then three involves a lot of words, three, and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we long to see you. So he, Timothy, have, we've sent him to you and he's spent some time with you. Now he's come back. He's brought us good news of three things. Your faith, your love, and I will say this, your treatment of us and others, including outsiders, which we see in the couple of verses at the end of chapter three, by extension. Three things, brought us good news of your faith, of your love, and of your treatment of us, your thoughts of us, and by extension, outsiders. There's something unusual and really special about this phrase, it's brought us good news. That 
is the verb in the Greek text here, uh, euangelizo. That doesn't mean anything to you except that it sounds a bit, even in Greek, like evangelism because this is the verb to preach the gospel. And in every other usage in the New Testament, it means to preach the good news gospel of Jesus' death and resurrection that saves you from the eternal penalty of your sins. Except here. This is talking about good news that Timothy brought to Paul of a church. And again, another powerful insight as to how much Paul really loved this church. You get to see not only Paul the apostle, but Paul the pastor. He calls news of the Thessalonian church in a way that puts it at least syntactically on par with the good news of Jesus's death and resurrection to save us from sins. He's not equating the two, but he uses the term and it's incredibly unique. Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news. I love that. He's brought us gospel news of you in three areas, of your faith, of your love, and your thoughts of us and treatment of others. Now let's get down to the heart of this passage. Verse seven, for this reason, brethren, in all of our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. It's a Powerfully interesting little sentence there. He says, hey, all this good news about your love and your faith and your thoughts of us and treatment of others, it brought us great comfort in the midst of our affliction and suffering. Let me ask you to think with me about Paul. Now, I've told you that this is one of the earliest letters of Paul and all that we know is that's probably pretty accurate. Apart from the letter to the Galatian churches, which is a circular letter in an area, the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonian church is probably his earliest, written about the year 50. Paul doesn't die under Nero persecution um, until maybe 68 or 69. So this is almost 20 years before his death. This is really early in his apostolic ministry. Again, this is uh, only his second missionary journey of three, and the third one is really, really long. Um, And um, Paul is near the beginning of his great adventure, but we already know that he has been stoned once so badly that they thought he was dead and left him out of the city, except he got up and walked back into the city. In Philippi, just down the street, he was beaten with rods along with Silas and then jailed, so he's gone through some hard things already. I'm not suggesting that he's gone through everything that he's gone through yet when he writes this letter. But we know in later letters that he received the 40 lashes from the Jews five times. Now, this is pretty horrible. Um, um, From the Romans, excuse me, not from the Jews, from the Romans, the 40 lashes, um, they would take off the one um, because that was the mercy of Rome. So they always called it 40 lashes minus one. Um, Now, this was a pretty grotesque thing. It wasn't meant to um, um, lacerate your skin. It was all um, meant to um, cause ruptures of your skin because these were more painful and took longer to heal. He received that five times. He was stoned multiple times. He's beaten multiple times. He he spent a night and day in in, in the open sea. Um, He was constantly, he says, in danger of cold and hunger and threats on the road and threats on the sea. Um, He went through a lot, so much so that if you read the book of Acts very carefully, you'll notice the author of Acts, also the author of the Gospel of Luke, Luke, who was a doctor, Dr. Luke, I'll call him, includes himself in the story of Paul at several places by using the word we and us. We were there together. So Luke is with Paul. And then there are times when they were there. Luke is not with Paul. And then he appears with Paul again. Luke doesn't want to take a lot of attention. So in Acts, we very rarely see Luke's name, but we see it in the we and the us. And then in some of Paul's letters, Paul will mention Luke. And we seem, if we place all that together, that Luke seems to be more present near the end of Paul's life. Now, let me ask you the question. Why would Paul, at the end of his life, need a doctor? 
Well, for a couple of reasons. Um, Luke is writing probably his gospel in the book of Acts, and a lot of that information comes directly from Paul. He was the only one there, or the only one willing and able to contain and convey that information to Luke to write down. But we can't deny the fact that practically, medically, physically, the apostle Paul probably needed a doctor to care for him, to care for his body. I don't know, nobody knows what the Apostle Paul looked like. In fact, we have no physical description of him in the New Testament. We do have a description of him from very, very early, about 150 AD, and it says that he was short, bald-headed, hook-nosed, and a unibrow. It's true, okay? I'm not making that up. Uh, And so he probably had an eyesight problem, but here is a guy. Can you imagine what he looked like at the end of his life? may be very, very difficult to walk and move. Could you imagine what his back looked like, what his feet looked like, what his hands looked like, what his eyes looked like? Here's a man who have given the vitality of his life, maybe his best decades, to the service of the church, and then received the world's penalty for that in his physical body. Now, all of that I know, or at least some of that is yet future, but look at what he says in verse seven. For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted by your faith, he says. In all of our distress and affliction, what lifted our heads, what lifted our hearts, what comforted us was to hear about your faith. Uh, I know most of you aren't called to be pastors or will never be a pastor or a vocational minister of the church, and that's completely fine. Uh, But I wish you could know what it's like to be comforted and to celebrate when uh, the the church family is walking in faith and in the truth. Um, Because I can tell you, for Liza and I, Um, Of all the things that we have gone through, of all the many distresses and afflictions and a little persecution here and there, um, when we are walking in the Spirit and sharing it together, we very rarely say, you know, it's all all worth it. When we get to see those faces and know those stories and make those connections and when we get to see people's lights come on for Jesus— and marriages get restored, and families get restored by the resurrection power of Jesus, and people going on mission and serving in their gifts, and the church has grown and being built up. It does, for at least me and many of the pastors and elders and servants of our church, it comforts us to know that you walk in the truth and in love. And so in some way, I thank you for that. I revel a bit like the Apostle John in his third epistle, third John. There's no chapter. Um, it's all one chapter, so it's very short. So let me read the first six verses of third John to you because he shares my sentiment. This is the old apostle. Um, as far as church history tells us, the one apostle of Jesus that lived the longest may have lived into the 90s or even to the turn of the second century. Um, and he, in his agedness, is the same writer of the John's Gospel in the book of Revelation, 1st, 2nd John. He says, to the elder, to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. He's writing to a guy who's a part of a church family. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. For I, the aged John, can you see him? I was very glad when brethren came and testified to your truth. That is how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, especially when they are strangers. They have testified to your love before the church. I have no greater joy and love than this, to hear my children walking in the truth. That's what Paul says. Back to 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 7, he says, you have no idea how in our distress and affliction we were comforted by your faith on the account of your faith. But now the heart of it is verse 8. Look at verse 8. For now... We really live. That's a strong statement. It's a strong statement. Very simple in the original language. Very simple even in English. And it's powerfully, powerfully unique. He says, we really live 
because of you. There's something about this Thessalonian church and the way that they have endured persecution and affliction and suffering. Don't forget that because we're about to zoom in on that for just a second and apply it to our life. The Thessalonian church was going through it. The same persecution, as I say every week, that threw Paul and Silas and Timothy out of town in the middle of the night remained on that church family. And he says, now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. That's the center of the text. For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. Let's handle that little word if because it's not exactly accurate to the Greek text. It's perfectly accurate translation of the Greek text because there's an if in there, but that's called the conditional sentence. And there are many different constructions for conditional sentences in Greek, and they all mean something slightly different. This one is unique because it breaks a bunch of the rules. It doesn't happen like normal conditional sentence. There's first, second, third, fourth class conditional sentences. This one uses the word if, but then a particular form of the verb that comes later, stand firm. And that combination, without any question or unclarity, says that this is not a potential, it's not a question, it's a fact. So we can more accurately translate this in this way. For now we really live because you stand firm in the Lord, or since you stand firm in the Lord. This unique construction makes it perfectly clear to us that Paul is not questioning whether they stand firm. He is celebrating it. For now we really live because you stand firm in the Lord. Now, I told you about these three areas. Let's talk about how this church in Thessalonica in the days of Paul were standing firm in their faith, in their love for one another, and in their thoughts of Paul and Silas and Timothy and their thoughts towards outsiders. And let's apply that to our context. How might God be creating us to be a retaining wall? To stand firm. This idea of conviction is what stand firm means. Um, Stand firm in our faith in ourselves, in our own heart and mind and soul, in our love, and I think contextually speaking here in 1 Thessalonians 3, this is love for one another, love inside the church, and our thoughts and actions and words towards outsiders. How might you stand firm in your personal faith, in your own soul and mind, in this day and age. I don't know if you've realized it, maybe sometimes even just unconsciously or subconsciously, we don't give enough credence to the fact that you were born on the day and year in which you were born as a perfect attribute of God's sovereign ordination of time. Esther got it. Perhaps for this reason I was here. For this purpose God has put me here. Jesus got it in the fullness of time. He came forth at the right time, at the perfect time. Do you know all of that is true for you too? And that God has chosen your life and heart to be your age, to have your family, to have your spiritual gifts, to be planted in this specific geography of the earth for this day, for this year, for this season. He's planted you here. And that's not an accident. And so how might you, like the Thessalonian church, stand firm in your faith in this time? Because challenges are ripe, aren't they? We've talked about this only and primarily because um, this is true for the Thessalonian church. They were under great affliction and persecution. Um, I think that is increasingly so for the church in the West. 
And so the question from the text, how might you stand firm in your own soul and faith? Especially when you sit down with a family member or a coworker and you begin to talk about life. Maybe you're trying to encourage them. Maybe they're trying to encourage you. Maybe you're going through a hard time or they're going through a hard time and Jesus comes up or God comes up or the Bible comes up or prayer comes up and you simply say, you know, I'm gonna be praying for you, which is something that Liza and I say all the time to outsiders, unbelievers, lost people, because I've never had somebody go, oh, uh, please don't do that. What, did, you say, did you say pray? No, 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 no. They always say, oh, yeah, yeah I, I would appreciate that. Even if they, you know, pray to the universe or a hedgehog or something, I don't know. But um, when I say I, we want to pray for you, they always say, oh, yeah, thank you. But what if in this changing world you, you say that and the response is different? What if, what if people feel attacked when you say that? What if people... Um, change the way that they respond. How will you react and stand firm in your faith in those moments? You know, those conversations are, are tricky in the world. They're even more tricky inside our home, inside our family, at the family reunion, at the dinner table with extended family. When you get a new sister-in-law or brother-in-law or a new cousin or a new family friend joins in or your parents who are divorced remarry and all of a sudden we have whole new sections of the family that are coming in and that can be a challenge. How will you stand firm in your faith? How will you be a retaining wall? Not primarily against something. I hope that you know and hope that you hear from me that as Christians and Jesus followers, I want us primarily, it's not only, but primarily to be known by what we are for, not what we are against. What we are for, not what we protest. I know the two are connected and I understand that. But how might God want you to stand firm in your faith, to be a retaining wall for grace and truth in the gospel, for Jesus, for the Trinity, for the Holy Spirit, for the church, for sin, for salvation by faith. It's going to be increasingly difficult. How about the second one? How about stand firm in your love? Again, I take that contextually as love for one another. You see it in the first verse, verse six, come to us and has brought us good news of your faith, one, and love, two, your love for one another. I hope you're not just discovering how hard the last few years or the last many months has been on our love for each other. There's been some challenges. There's been some deep challenges. And more than... Um, uh, style of preaching or the color of the carpet or the name of the church or the change or this or that, this season of time has brought upon our inside internal church relationships a level of pressure that is unprecedented in my experience. And there's some challenges. How will you, friend, stand firm in your love for the people sitting around you? How will you stand firm in your love for one another? Especially when you might have some strongly held differences of opinion. I don't know of anybody, actually, who holds an opinion lightly. <laughs> Not in my life. I don't. It's kind of anecdotal around here, um, especially on our staff. Be careful what you ask Scott's opinion on because he'll give it to you because he has opinion just about everything, all right? Um, the color of the light in the room. Nobody's ever thought about. Scott has an idea on that, you know, and how to make it and tune it just right, okay? So I'm a pretty opinionated guy, especially when it comes to life and truth and gospel and theology. I want to talk about those things. But what happens when differences when challenges put us at odds with a brother or sister in the Lord. How will I, how will you stand firm in a commitment of love for one another? Uh, perhaps the better question is, how will we stand firm in a commitment to continually seek reconciliation so that we make sure that the devil never gets a foothold on us 
never gets a foothold in our relationships, never begins to work his divisive schemes on the unity of our family. We have to be constantly vigilant, stand firm. How will you stand firm in your love for each other? Stand firm, by the way, is in the present tense, which for Greek means that it's an ongoing battle, ongoing reality. How about the third area? When Paul says, and your thoughts towards us, which again speak to what he mentioned in chapter two, some of the accusations of Paul's character and um, his, his mission, his values, his vision for the church. But also by extension, and we see that at the end of chapter three, their thoughts towards the outsiders, towards others, towards even the people who are doing the persecution and afflicting them. How will we stand firm as Jesus did and, has, and would have us do towards those outsiders, towards the ones who are persecuting us, towards the ones who mock us and speak ill of us, towards those who say the truth that you call truth, that I would call truth, I see and feel as hate. And what you call gospel, I feel like is mm, divisive, dangerous, dangerous philosophy. Again, I told you back in even the 50s, C.S. Lewis said that religion is already being considered as neurosis. Now, 70 plus years later, that has only grown. That Christian theology and a focus on Jesus in many parts of the earth is considered to be dangerous. How will we stand firm in that culture? with grace and truth and love and gentleness and respect, uncompromising stance towards those on the outside. Always ready to give a reason for the hope that is within us, yet to do so with gentleness and respect, to show love. Again, not to be known primarily what we're against, but what we're for, what we promote, what we celebrate, how we live. How will you stand firm in that way? Abraham Kuyper is the name I keep running into. And I will see a quote from him or a reference to Abraham Kuyper, and I have no idea who this man is. And so every time I read a quote, I'm like, that's really profound, and it's simple, and it has weight to it. So I had to do some research. Abraham Kuyper is a believer, was a believer. He died in 1920. He was the prime minister of the Netherlands from like 1901 to 1905. Very... Um, uh, involved in the Dutch church of his day and actually helped promote it and go through some cultural changes at his time. Um, I want to share with you a quote from Abraham Kuyper. It's got some teeth in it. This is what he said. When principles that run against your deepest convictions begin to win the day, then battle is your calling. And peace has become sin. Hold that, we'll come back. You must, at the price of dearest peace, lay your convictions bare before friend and enemy with all the fire of your faith. He's talking at a time in his part of Europe where contending for the faith was very, very difficult. The early 19-teens, the Bolshevik Revolution is happening in Russia, and he is at the height of his career and influence when all of this is going on just a few hundred miles down the road to the east. When principles that run against your convic deepest convictions begin to win the day, battle is your calling. He says, what are convictions? Did you know that the Supreme Court has an official definition of the difference between beliefs and convictions? I didn't, but I do now. I studied that for this very moment. The Supreme Court says that beliefs are different than convictions, basically because of this. Beliefs can change. Convictions typically don't. That's their conclusion. I kind of like it. I think that beliefs and convictions are obviously related, but convictions are something stronger, shall I say, firmer, to stand firm in, 
than simply beliefs. So he says when principles that run against your deepest convictions begin to win the day, when the arm wrestle between your convictions and the culture begins to go against you, you know that the battle is on. Watch. And peace has become sin. That's a strong statement. What does he mean by that? I I hear Isaiah and Jeremiah in that statement who were prophesying to Israel and Judah and a time with great difficulty was coming. And Jeremiah and Isaiah would say, the false prophets around me, they're all crying out to you, peace, peace. And he says, but there is no peace because peace is not here and it's not coming. Consequences are coming to us. And that's what I have been crying out to you. Repent, wake up, come to your senses, see God in his character and see your actions as they are. The false prophets are saying to you, peace, peace. Abraham Kuyper may have been thinking of that when he said in this battle, peace can actually be a false idol, a false goal. Strong statement. How will you, getting back to 1 Thessalonians 3, how will you stand firm? I'll give you my big idea because I know I'm making you uncomfortable, meddling a little bit. (laughs) Let's get down to it. Unstable times requires steadfast conviction, not simply exit strategies. What do I mean by that last point? I mean this, that sometimes, again, perhaps unconsciously or subconsciously, we get a sense of the tension around us. We even read the news or we talk to our neighbor, our family. We know that things are changing. The barometer is different. And sometimes we are inclined to kind of lower our head a little bit and just say, let's just make it through. Let's just make it through. Let's not run into the tidal wave. Let's just make it through. And I would suggest to you that many, many generations before us who have made that choice regret it. And I don't want to be a church family that simply wants to make it through this time. We must learn how to stand firm, to be a retaining wall for the gospel of Jesus Christ for truth, for grace, for the character of God, for the word of God, for the morality of God's nature revealed in the scripture, for the calling of the church and his vision for the church in the world. We must stand firm in our faith, in our love, and towards outsiders. In unstable times, we need steadfast conviction. To end in 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 9 is really beautiful. Let's end there. Verse 9, for what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account? That's a really complicated way of saying something pretty simple. How can I ever thank God enough for how your faith has made me joyful. How can I ever thank God enough, Paul says, for how your standing firm in the faith and love and towards outsiders, how your faith has brought me so much joy, has brought me so much joy. That's true. G.K. Chesterton is often called the master without a masterpiece. He's an incredible writer of yesteryear. Um, He was a journalist and wrote most of his articles in rather short form on a wide, diverse range of topics. I had several collections of his journals and have been working my way through them over time. Let me share with you a thought from Chesterton as we close. He says this, we suffer. This is written in the 40s. We suffer from misplaced humility. Think about it for a second. We suffer from misplaced humility. Where humility should be applied to the organ of ambition, it has now been applied to the organ of conviction. From the beginning of time, men were supposed to doubt their own strength, but now they doubt the truth 
everything has been reversed. Think about it. We suffer now from misplaced humility. Where God has always wanted us to be humble is in the realm of our own ambition, the view of our own strength, the view of our own dreams that may or may not be God's dreams. He says, you need to have a very thick, constantly applied layer of humility on top of that area of your heart and life. But when it comes to your convictions, humility is not quite the word that would apply. Yes, we want to hold those with gentleness and respect, and for sure we want to make sure our convictions are true and biblical and right, and they represent the character of God. We want to check those with the Word, with His Spirit, with godly men and women, but we don't hold those with the same level of humility on which we put on top of our ambition. We hold those with conviction and we hold those with steadfastness and endurance and perseverance. Chesterton would say, we stand firm. Humility applies to our own ambition, but when it comes to truth, we must stand firm. And let's stand firm together, church.